Uh, so first of all, good morning. I hope you're all healthy and well, and thank you very much for joining us. Well, why did I come to this topic? The real, the, we entitled the class, Maimonides, Essential Teachings in Jewish Faith and Ethics, which is true. We're gonna deal with Maimonides as a central figure, but the real course should be named God for Grownups. Over the last number of months, I've been troubled by the problem of God and religion in general. What do I mean by that? I mean that we live in a very secular society that God doesn't play a particularly great role on some, for some people. And on the other side, there are people who are so extreme and their vision of God is so weird that it makes me wonder, makes me cringe to be identified with quotation marks religion. Religion should be brilliant, open, idealistic, transcendent, but in the popular way it's presented these days, it's obscurantist, it's anti-science, it's extreme. People murder each other in the name of religion. And when you think back from the beginning of history, there have been all kinds of religions, not just Judaism. There were paganisms and mythologies and uh, all over the in Greece and in Babylonia and from ancient times and all kinds of religions which espouse things very different from what we espouse, but where millions upon millions of people believed in these things, were willing to live and die for them. And the question is not only what is religion, but what is truth? And how does God fit into all this uh, discussion? Well, when I try to think about religion, I, one, I go back to a quotation that I read by Benjamin Nathan Cardozo, who was a judge. He wasn't a particularly religious person, but he had a speech in which he discussed a Danish astronomer from the 16th century named Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe devoted his whole life to looking at the stars. He had the most accurate description of, of the stars and the movement of the heavenly spheres. And this was all before there was such a thing as telescopes. He did it all with his naked eye. And to do that, you had to have tremendous precision, morning, noon, and night, mostly at night since he had to see the stars at night, but he had to have tremendous precision and mathematical brilliance to spend so much time to be so accurate. And here's what Cardozo says in praising Brahe. He says, the submergence of self in the pursuit of an ideal, the readiness to spend oneself without measure, prodigally, almost ecstatically, for something intuitively apprehended as great and noble. Spend oneself one knows not why. Some of us like to believe that that is what religion means. Oh boy. Religion means, in the eyes of Cardozo, a, a total giving of oneself to an ideal, self-sacrifice, uh, having this great vision and wanting with all your heart and soul to achieve that vision and be willing to give your life to it. And so I think that that's a beautiful definition of religion. We have to come back, he, interestingly in his definition of religion, he doesn't have the word God. <laughs> he talks about a scientist who is very devoted to science and astronomy, but Cardozo, Car Cardozo didn't mention the word, please mute your machines, okay? Thank you. So we would like to take Cardozo's definition, but add the word God to it. Now the question is, God. So I read a book recently, and I could rec recommend it to you also. It's called The God Gene by Dean Hammer, H-A-M-E-R. This man's a scientist, and he did research, and it was his concerted opinion that our spirituality, our sense of religion, yeah, come here. Is, in, is almost a genetically uh, predisposed property that we have. So let me go back to the parasha that we had last week. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Bereshit, at the very beginning of creation, it says that God created Adam, but Selah Elohim. God created human beings in the image of God. And scholars have tried to figure out what does it mean, image of God. We know it doesn't mean God's physical image because we don't believe God has a physical image. But what does it mean? Well, Maimonides says it means God, we have intelligence. Some people say it means free will. Uh, whatever interpretation you want to give. I give my own interpretation. Here's my interpretation. God created all of us with a quotation marks, God gene. All human beings have a predisposition to reach out to something transcendent, to live 
beyond our own limited sphere. Their ideas are a spiritual quality of every human being, at least in potential, and each of us develops it differently. Let me take, make an analogy. There's such a thing as music. And one of the people are on this program on our, our Zoom is a professional violinist, concerto expert, so a musician. But others are also on this Zoom. Some of us are, in fact, geniuses in music. We were born with a gift, or we worked very hard at it, and the, you could achieve a very high level. Others of us, such as myself, can carry a tune, but that's about as far as we can go with music. We can appreciate music. And some people are basically atonal. They can't hear music at all, or they hear it on a very poor level. And so it is, I think, with spirituality. God created human beings, but sell them out of him. But each of us has a different power, a different inspiration, a different level of reception. Another analogy would be a radio. Uh, radio waves are always there, but unless you have a proper antenna, you don't pick up all of those radio waves. So someone with a very fine antenna could pick up radio waves from thousands of miles away. And someone with a very poor antenna just gets a little static. But each of us has some quality of ability to hear that radio. And each of us has some quality to be able to hear or feel the spirituality. Now, this, uh, in this book by uh, Mr. Dr. Hammer, he quotes another scholar as follows. There is evidence of religious belief more than 60,000 years ago among Neanderthal men. In other words, religion or spirituality, let's call it, is not a modern invention. It seems to be indigenous to human beings. From the very beginning of existence, even pre-human beings such as Neanderthal men had a religious sense. How do they know that? Well, they, they know that because Neanderthal man used to do burials. Normally, if an animal dies, they just leave it there. The carcass dies and they leave it there and the, the vultures come and eat it up. Neanderthal man started burying people. The implication is there's a holiness to a human being, there's a purpose to the human being, and there's a life after. When they bury, and often in ancient times, they buried the person with implements or with his animal as though he's bringing it or she is bringing it to the next world. So that belief of somehow a transcendent, not only this world, but another world beyond death was something that seems to go back very far in human history. Now, where did this genetic inspiration for faith or direction toward, towards faith come from? So here's what he writes. I believe our genetic predisposition for faith is no accident. It provides us with a sense of purpose beyond ourselves and keeps us from being incapacitated by our dread of mortality. Our faith gives us the optimism to press on regardless of the hardships we face. He's a, in his book, he tries to point out that the, the um, faith or religion serves a evolutionary purpose. It makes us live longer. It makes us look out for others. And in fact, that's why he says, uh, we survive with faith because faith actually has practical advantages for us. But it's not just practical advantages. People believe that there is something beyond us. There's something we want, we, we strive for. And he writes as follows. There are differences between religiosity and spirituality. So let me go, let me go back to this a moment. We said that originally that human beings are created with a spiritual sense. That spiritual sense is manifested in our reaching out to God, but transcendence in general, it could be music, it could be poetry, it could be art. There's something in us that wants us to reach beyond ourselves and to transcend ourselves. But what's the relationship between spirituality and religion? Now, this is a touchy question. Ideally, spirituality is very personal. It's each individual according to his and her own sensitivity. Each of us has a different radar screen and each of us receives it differently. But what about religion? Religion has a cult, it has a, what we believe in, it has a, a certain ideology, a creed, it has forms of worship, it has, yes, what you can do, and no, what you cannot do. How does that relate to the spirituality? So the general argument given is that individuals, yes, have the spiritual sense, but it's fleeting. In other words, you can't feel spiritual every moment of the day, it's too hard. Just can't do it. You have to live a practical life. You have to be a, a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, whatever you are. You have to work. And you can't sit down and, and spiritualize all day long unless you're a monk living in a, as a hermit in a mountain. 
But most of us can't live that way. So spirituality has to be, so to speak, controlled. How do we control it? We put it into a box. The box is called religion. Religion gives us a formal way to solidify and to, to give a framework to our individual spiritual feelings. So religion eventually, according to this thought, was it developed in order to have us communally or as a people relate to this transcendent God, but in a way that all of us can share something and still have individual personality is maintained. Now, so, the, so religion in general is a create, an attempt to create a framework for connection with God, giving spirituality a home. Each religion from the beginning of time until now essentially tries to do that. So ideally, if you're in a synagogue or if you're of any other religion, you go to some other religious framework, church or mosque or whatever. When you go, Hi. Neil, please. Yeah, please, I'm actually please, listening to some of you. you well, I'll, I'll listen to you as well. Um, yeah, I've been very please busy today. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please mute your machine. Oh, yes. Thank Hello. you, Brent. So when we go to a synagogue uh -huh. or any place of worship, the ideal is not only to feel uh -huh. a community with others who are worshiping the same way, but to somehow kindle the flame within us or to enhance the flame within us toward their own personal spirituality. Now, where does religion come from? So all the secularists or yeah. modern scientists, religion is basically a, uh, a, a sop for the masses. Mm -hmm. It's basically a- um, Yeah. Send, by the way, I've sent, we've sent our article to Telegram 10 mute. minutes ago. Please. Well, I mean, Rowan is amazing. Hello, could you please mute um, your machine? I think it's very good. I, I think it's, well, we'll see what they say. It's not going in yet. Probably seven, because, because you please you know, mute I wanted to. Could you someone yeah. tell her? I'm sorry. Rabbi? Sorry. Yeah, I don't there's know how to mute. There's a way for the host to mute how? everybody. How do I do that? I don't know. Neither do I. Nobody else knows. There is a oh, way. I, to... That's my daughter. I'll, I'll, for next time, I'll try to do that. I don't know how okay. to do it. I try to rely on everyone's own judgment, but it doesn't always work. Anyway, the secular approach is this, that religion began because people are, were ignorant. They were afraid. They saw lightning. They didn't know where it came from. So they, there must be a God that controls lightning. They see the sunrise. There must be a God that controls the sunrise. They see death. There must be a God of death. They see the ocean. There must be a God of the ocean. So people, out of fear, out of ignorance, developed a sense of gods. And from the sense of gods, uh, they formalized some kind of, we should, in order to appease the god, we need rain. So let's worship. Let's bring a sacrifice. Let's bring an offering. Let's pray. Let's do a, a rain dance. Whatever it would be. So different religions develop different system based on, according to this view, fear, based on a lack of understanding, like a lack of wisdom. So the secular's approach was that not... They didn't pay attention to human spirituality. It was basically, religion didn't grow out of human spirit. It grew out of human ignorance, out of human fear. And I don't think so. Um, I think it's just quite the different. Not that, not, that we del not that those elements weren't true. People did have fear and people were ignorant by and large, as, as we still are ignorant of many things. But the drive towards religion wasn't merely out of fear, out of appeasement of the, of the gods, but rather it was out of a sense of the sacred. There's something within us, spiritual, that makes us want to go beyond. There's a beautiful psalm, Psalm number 16, that says, Shiviti Adonai Lenegdi Tamid. I have set the Lord always before me. Surely he is at my right hand. When I was a kid growing up in Seattle on Shabbat afternoons, we used to sing certain psalms, and this is one of them. God is always by my side. God is by my side. I will not be moved. I've, I, I have the strength. I walk in the presence of God. There's a famous joke story, I don't know what it is, um, of a certain individual that used to go to a synagogue. And all of a sudden, instead of going to that synagogue, he switched and he went to another synagogue. So after a few months, the rabbi of the first synagogue, he missed his congregant, and he meets him in the street and says, Moshe, I haven't seen your synagogue the last few months. He says, well, you know, now I pray in a, in a little synagogue down the block. What? How could you go there? Our synagogue is much bigger, it's much grander, we have a choir, we, 
very glorious. We have uh, beautiful windows. Uh, we have a beautiful service. How can you go to this other little synagogue? It's a nothing, it's a no place. The uh, rabbi there is a nothing. The, the synagogue there is a, a little hole in the wall. How could you go there instead of to our beautiful synagogue with a rabbi with a PhD who's very brilliant? So Moshe said, well, I'll tell you why. I went to this new synagogue and the rabbi taught me how to read minds. What? How could you read minds? I'll, say, I'll, I'll read your mind right now. Okay, please read it. Okay, Rabbi, here's what you're thinking. You're thinking, I place God always beside me. God is at my right hand. Wrong, I'm not thinking that way. That's why I left your synagogue. That's why I went to the other synagogue, because in that synagogue, that's what the rabbi is always thinking. That's the difference between religion at its worst and spirituality and religion at its best. At its worst, it becomes a formal set, a framework. It's a system, it's a bureaucracy. It is what it is. At its best, it teaches us to feel the presence of God always. When we walk into that synagogue, we feel, ah, oh, I'm redeemed, I'm beyond myself. I'm, I'm on a different sphere, different mental sphere. Now, this feeling, which of course, since I'm Jewish and Orthodox rabbi, for me, that's the most meaningful thing. But I remember, and through my readings and studies, I've, I've read many things from different religions and impacted by different things, but the religious sense, I think, is very much the same among all people, regardless of their specific religion. The, idea, the ideal, the searching for a transcendent God is universal. When I was at Yeshiva College, I went to the, I was just a teenager in those days, early 20s maybe, I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and there was a painting of Tommaso Portinari. Never forget that painting. And I bought a print of it. It looked to me, it's, 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 later on I found out it's not exactly what I, I thought it was. It, looked, it has a picture of what I looked, it looked to me like a monk with his hands in a prayerful position, in a very thoughtful position. You can go to Google and you can see Tommaso Portinari, you can see the painting. And I took that and I put it on my wall in Yeshiva. People said, what's strange? How could you have a picture of a monk? He wasn't a monk, by the way, but we thought he was a monk. <laughs> How come you have a picture of a monk on the, on the wall? I said, I'm not looking at a monk. I'm not looking at a Christian. I'm looking at a human being who's looking for God. I'm seeing a human being that's looking for the same God that I'm looking for through a different avenue, different street, but the same way. Years ago, I read a book by, a uh, very phenomenal book by uh, a 13th century Muslim Sufi. His name is Rumi, R-U-M-I. And it's very beautiful passages. And one of those passages, he writes, whatever I was looking for was always you. Oh, whatever I was looking for was always you. That's shiviti adonai lednegdita meet. I put God always by my side. Wherever I'm looking, wherever I'm going, I'm looking for you. I want to be with you. I want to feel that, that, that essence. I want to feel that spirit. So the, thus far in this discussion, we haven't got to Rambam yet, we will. We're just trying to give the foundations of religion and spirituality. Spirituality is that sense that we all have for transcendence. And then religion is a framework that we have for trying to fulfill it, that spirituality or to give, give arms and legs to that spiritual feeling. In a nutshell, Judaism has many things that are spiritual, that move us towards an individual spirituality, but the whole framework, the halakha, the system of laws and customs and traditions and liturgy, those things are spiritual, but more than, the, or different from spiritual, they're religion. They are the framework, a, a box within which our spirituality is supposed to flourish. So all the laws that we have shouldn't be seen as laws do this, don't do that, they should be seen as, this is the key that I have to make me feel that God is right next to me. When I have to make a blessing before I eat food, I have to eat all day long, I have to eat different food, I'm hungry. Before I put the food in my mouth, I make a blessing. God, you're right here with me. I, 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 I notice you, I feel you, I feel your presence. I wouldn't have this food without you. This kind of dependence, this kind of feeling of intertwined, being intertwined with the divine this is the character of a religious person. And the halakha, which sometimes unfortunately is just taken in a very mechanical way, 
is really supposed to be a very spiritual framework for us to take our individual spirituality. Let me go to a famous midrash. It says when the God gave the Torah to us at Mount Sinai, the uh, Pasuk says that the Kol Adonai Bakoach, the voice of God came in power. And the Midrash says, the rabbinical interpretation says, God's voice came to each person in his own and her own power. In other words, God spoke to thousands of people, but each person heard something different. Each person heard what was on his or her own level, more sophisticated, mm -hmm. less sophisticated, higher degree of, of uh, antenna or lower degree of antenna, but each person heard something very personal. And that's what essentially is supposed to happen within religion. The religion is given to us, each person according to his and her own power. Each one of us has opportunity to grow and to, to rise to higher levels, but ultimately yeah. we have to work within who we are. Religion is not just a communal national thing, it's ultimately a very personal thing. Our search for God okay. is very personal. When we're born, we're born alone. When we die, we die alone. There's nobody there to hold our hand when we die. We're all alone. And that is ultimately the test of a human being. When you're all alone at the very end, nothing more to talk about. God, you were with me my whole life. And you're with me now. And I'm not afraid. We see at the end of the Adon Olam, God is with me. I'm not afraid. The hallmark of a really religious person is not to be afraid, interestingly enough. It's, it's not a, a psychological sop. It's not a defensive mechanism, I don't believe. I believe it's based on an internal serious belief in the presence of God. And it doesn't, it's not restricted to one religion or another religion. It's a universal human phenomenon. And each person, whatever religion they are in, needs to find that way to fulfill their personal spiritual quest. We know religion is false, by the way, if it teaches us ugly things, if it teaches us to murder other people in the name of faith, God couldn't, God couldn't do that. This is the false God. If it teaches us to worship idols and think that those idols are God, that's a false God. If we think that uh, God commands us to be cruel to other people, to be uh, ruthless to other people, or to cheat other people based on their religion or race, that's, that's not God. God is the best we can aspire to as human beings. God is the highest ideal. Well, then let's go back to Rambam now, all right? Rambam was a great philosopher, as you know. He lived in the, from 1138 to 1204. He's probably the greatest philosopher in the Jewish history, certainly the one who had the greatest influence. And I would say also from uh, the time the Torah was given until now, there's probably no one quoted more than Maimonides. He just is a superstar. It's a, you come across someone once in a generation, this is once in, uh, in thousands of years. He had a phenomenal mind. He not only was a philosopher, he wrote world-class philosophy, he was a world-class halachic expert. He wrote the Court of Jewish Law, which, was, uh, which is still a Mishneh Torah, still the foundation of all of our studies of Jewish law. You can't study any field of Judaism since the time of Maimonides without him playing a front and center role. So the book we're going to use is called, interestingly enough, Maimonides' Essential Teachings on Jewish Faith and Ethics. It's a book I edited. I, I edited and translated. If you have the book, terrific. If you don't, you could get it probably through Amazon or through Barnes and Noble. You don't need to have the book. You know, I'm, I'm pushing the book. It's, I don't get royalties. Don't worry. It's not a, a whatever royalty I get, I, I give to Sadaka anyway. But it's for the purpose of uh, ease using the same text. But if you have another text of Rambam, it's fine. Now. I said before that the secular approach is, or the modern approach is, that religion grew out of ignorance and fear. That human beings originally didn't have, they had a spiritual sense, but it was based on, I, I don't know, I have to appease the gods in one way or another, because I need favors from the gods. I can manipulate the gods. If I only would bring enough sacrifices, I can manipulate the god to do what I want to do. And so various religions developed shamans and different medical workers, wonder workers, and healers, all who promised be, to be able to appease the gods and give um, good things to the people if they would only pay the price and bring the sacrifices say the proper prayers. Maimonides has a totally different view. And in, we're gonna start actually 
in the laws of idolatry. We're switching back on and off to different chapters, but today I'm going to talk about the lies of idolatry, the laws of idolatry. It's also the lies of idolatry. This was a slip of the tongue, but it was a good one. My mind starts with the following assumption based on our Torah. God created Adam and Chava. Did Adam and Chava, were they idolaters? No. Did they believe in God? How could they not believe in God? God created them. They were talking to God. God was talking to them. Was there, was there five gods? Of course there was not five gods. There was one God. They, and who knew them? Adam, Adam and spoke to this one God. It was not, it was no theological uh, trick. There was no, no fear. No, not because of ignorance. They had a direct relationship with God. And if you look at the early chapter of the Torah, you find Noah, right? We just read about Noah last week. Noah, God comes to Noah, Noah, this is a lousy generation. I'm going to flood them out and I'm going to save your life. Did Noah believe in God? Of course he believed in God. Of course he spoke to God. And God saved them according to the, to, to the Torah in this ark. You all know the story. There wasn't a question of fear. There wasn't a question of appeasing God. There wasn't a question of of a, a secular view of religion. They knew God. There was an idolatry. There was no idolatry. There was a there was a monotheism. So Maimonides, instead of saying we started off as ignorant beings striving to God out of our fear and our ignorance, Maimonides starts, according to the Torah also, human beings started with a relationship with God one-to-one. -one. We, we were not uh, ignorant and we were not afraid. We had this one-to-one -one relationship with God and we knew that there was one God. We believed in one God. Here's what my mom, so then where did idolatry come from? So let me read my monodies. In the days of Enosh, who was the son of Seth, the grandson of Adam, human beings made a great error and the thoughts of the sages of that generation became corrupted. Enosh himself was among those who erred. This was their mistake, they said. Because God created the stars and heavenly spheres to govern the world, placing them on high with honor as his servants, it is proper to praise and exalt and revere them. It must be the will of God, blessed be he, that we aggrandize and honor that which he has created, just as a king would want us to honor the high-ranking servants. This is the honor of the king. So suddenly, this is what happened according to Maimonides. People looked at the sun and the stars and the moon, and they said, these are great creations by God. Wow, God, you're terrific, wonderful. You did such a great job. And since you honored these stars and the moon and the sun by putting them so high in heaven, we're going to honor them too. And we're, by honoring them, we're honoring you. So we bring an offering to the sun, not because the sun is God, but because the sun is a manifestation of God's greatness. They weren't praying to the moon because the moon is the moon, because they thought the moon was a god. They prayed to the moon because they thought the moon was a creation of God. And this was their way of showing honor to God. Like, for example, if you like me, which you should, of course, like me, and instead of praising me, you praise my son or my daughter, I'm honored too. I think it's wonderful. I like it. I'm glad you like my children. That's great. Or you, try, you praise my grandchildren. I feel very good about that. Likewise, they think when God sees that we're praising his own creations. God thinks, oh, it's wonderful. I feel, I feel terrific about that. That was a mistake. Then later on, says my mother, people got so used to worshiping the star and the moon and the stars, they started saying these things actually have divine power. And then eventually, they said, you know, if we make a, um, a statue of the sun, a picture of the sun, or a picture of the moon, or a picture of stars, or a picture of anything else, we could, instead of looking at the star, we could actually look at the, at the statue and pray to that statue. And the statue wasn't God itself, but it was a symbol of God. And eventually people drifted away until they started thinking the statues really are God or, or symbols of God. And this is how Maimonides starts the, the, the story. Humanity in its spiritual quest, the very beginning, where they were all monotheists. Ideally, we started off at a very high level but we lost the high level due to intellectual error. We, instead of re realizing that God doesn't want to use these things, God, we thought that these things are worthy of, of emulation, worthy of, of worship. This is also, by the way, why Maimonides would think that the Torah is so emphatic about us not worshiping idols. The Torah is, is, is wild. If you go through the Torah carefully, 
You'll see so many times when God warns you, don't worship idols, don't follow the stars, don't follow the sun, don't make pictures, don't make idols. Even in the Ten Commandments, God is emphatic. There's no other God except me. Why is God so emphatic about it? You know, it's, a, it's an ego problem, Havdil. What's the problem? The answer is God knows our human nature, that human beings, instead of having the ability to worship or to go to an unseen power, a transcendent power, it's so much easier for us to, to have a little statue or have a little idol or to look at a sun or a star or a moon. It's, it makes it it's closer to us. So God says, don't fall for that mistake. That's a mistake. Stay focused on the one God. So then generations went by when people were, were now idolaters. So Maimonides says, with the passage of time, false prophets arose and said, God has commanded, worship a certain star or all the stars and, and certain beings and bring them offerings and libations, build an altar, make an image. Why did people listen to these people? When people come along and they say, we're prophets and God told us to do this, this and that. Why did people fall for that? Why didn't they say right away, oh, don't give us nonsense. It's foolish, God is God. These are, these are we're not gonna worship idols and, and we're not gonna worship the sun and the moon. We know God is God. Why didn't they just answer that way? The answer is, with all the respect to humanity, we're very gullible, and in fact, we have fear. And one of the manifestations of fear is reliance on strength. Supposedly have power. And this isn't just a matter of ancient pagans who are ignorant. It's true today, too. I've quoted this many times. In the, there was an article a few years ago in Forbes magazine about the, the richest rabbis in Israel. I'm not one of them. I don't live in Israel. I wouldn't be one of the top 10 anyway. Um, but the, the 10 rabbis, though, the richest one had $300 million, not shekels, $300 million. And the poorest one of them had, I think, $10 million. <laughs> How did these rabbis get so much money? Being a rabbi, you don't, you don't make much money. Not, not like that. I looked at this carefully. What did I see? Almost all these multi multi million rabbi, uh, rabbis were either Hasidic rabbis. Hasidic rabbis or Sephardic Kabbalists. What does it mean? It means people pay good money because they want blessings, they want magic. They think these people have spiritual powers. They go to them and they pay money. There was when the COVID crisis first broke out, there was a charity in Israel that sent us a picture, sent us a, a flyer to, to donate, pictures of all kinds of holy rabbis with big long white beards. And that if you contribute such and such dollars to this, to this charity, we guarantee that no one in your family will get COVID. This is, this is insane. Thousands of people send money in. Why? Don't they realize who, who have, if these rabbis had such power, why don't they get rid of the disease altogether? And what do you have to pay for it? They can say, listen, free of charge, I'm going to eliminate the disease. This is a hoax. This is a gimmick. Why do people fall for it? Because people are afraid and people are desperate. They figure, oh, maybe there's a chance. Maybe these guys do have power. Maybe they're, if I get a little red ribbon around my wrist, maybe it will help me. Maybe it will protect me. Maybe if I have the rabbi bless my whiskey, maybe that will save me. Maybe that will cure my uh, sick relative. People have an innate fear. And if someone comes along and says, I can save you, I'm a healer, I have magic connections, people, many people, fall for it. And it's not just a problem of antiquity. It's a problem even of our own time. So these prophets, according to, to Maimonides, came along and he calls them false prophets. What is a prophet? A prophet doesn't come and say, I'm telling you, here's my advice personally. No, a false prophet says, I have it in the name of the gods or I have it in the name of God. I'm coming to you with a greater authority. You are benighted human beings. You don't have the connection that I have. I, since I'm so spiritual, I have that direct connection. And I can manipulate God or the gods as they believed in those days to do what you want. If you just give me the right amount of money or you bring the right amount of offerings or you provide the, or you do the service the way I tell you to do it. It's a control issue and people fall for it. Now these prophets were they all, we call them false prophets, which of course they are false. Did they really believe what they were saying themselves? And you know, strangely enough, I think many of them did believe it. Some of them were just, um, you know, charlatans, they made it up. But human beings have a great capacity to lie to themselves. And there are all kinds of testimonials in every kind of religion. 
If you read people's religion, they had a vision. They spoke to God. God came to them. There's something called the Jerusalem complex, by the way. It's a non psychological thing. People go to Jerusalem, and all of a sudden they start prophesying. They start, you can go to Google, look up, look up Jerusalem complex, I think it's called, or Jerusalem syndrome. When people suddenly, like, as soon as they get to Jerusalem, they suddenly become prophets. They believe themselves to have gotten this vision. And when they come to speak to other people, they're not coming as liars. They're coming as witnesses of something that they and themselves experienced. So it's a very touchy phenomenon. I can't go into all of it. I don't know all of it myself. But according to Maimonides, these false prophets came along and many, many people fell for it. And this way, says Maimonides, they began to make idols in their temple, under trees, on top mountains, in the valleys. They told the people that idols bring good and evil. It is proper to serve it and to fear it. Okay, without going any further into my monitor, he says, well, how did this all change? It's all change with Abraham. All things with Abraham. Abraham came along and he said, you know what? All these people are misguided. Let's go back to what we knew from Abraham, what we knew, what we knew from Adam, what we knew from Noah, and there are other shame, Ava, there were other people along the, in the in the historical uh, past who had correct vision of God. Let's go back to that. And, and Maimonides describes Abraham as always the first philosopher, that he philosophized through philosophical insight. He came to the conclusion that there must be a God, not as one God, and this God created the world, etc., etc., and the God idols need to be crushed. Now, here's another point. Where does religion come from? Does it come from our brain? Or they come from our hearts. It probably comes from both places. But where's the stimulus? Do we reach out to God because of how we feel? We feel God's presence? Or do we come to God because we've intellectually philosophized there must be a God? So I'm not a psychologist. I'm not an expert on those things. But just based on my own anecdotal feelings, the source of religion is in the heart, not in the brain. We need the brain to, as a corrective to the heart because the heart goes nuts. The heart we can become uh, go crazy. So we need a brain to be rational and to keep things in line. But the impetus to religion comes from the heart. Why do I say that? If I were to give a person um, Maimonides' text on, on belief in God and to intellectually understand God, would that make a person believe in God? If they went to a class in philosophy no. and studied philosophy and all the proofs for the existence of God, etc., will that make a person believe in God? My no. feeling, no. It might make a pe people understand why other people believe in God, but it's not going to change a person's inter internal religious beliefs. But if a person feels the presence of God, you can't teach this from that. That's not from the book. That's not from your brain. If a person's receptor is um, turned on, that's, what, that's what's going to turn the person towards religion. And therefore, by the way, in, in uh, Judaism, but in any other religions also, what makes people more religious? Lectures by the rabbi, which are convenient, of course, but that's not going to turn people on as much as music, as much as a Shabbat meal, as much as something emotional, an emotional context in which the spirit has a chance to, to, to swim and to grow and to float. When we have an emotional context, then the intellectual quality comes not to initiate the religious faith, but to put this religious faith in a, into a strong context. So we need both heart and mind, but heart that comes first. And we're going to close very soon. And next week, we're going to actually go to the beginning of Mishneh Torah, which is all intellect. Maimonides was But before closing, I want to say one thing about Maimonides. Maimonides was perhaps the greatest philosophical rationalist in Jewish history. Brilliant beyond, beyond. He was the quintessential rationalist. He had a son, Abraham, Abraham Maimon, Rabbi Abraham Maimon, who became very much influenced by the Sufi Muslim uh, uh, Sufism. It's a kind of mysticism. And in fact, there's now a, it's called a lineage, a Sufi lineage in the name of Maimonides' son, Abraham Maimonides. So the father, who was an arch-rationalist, his son was, I'm not going to call him a Sufi because he was a Jewish, and he was always a pious Jew, but who was very, very much influenced by 
of mysticism. So I was looking at a program and someone asked me, how could Maimonides have raised a person who was a mystic if he was such a rationalist person? And I said, both of them were searching for God. Both of them were brilliant religious people, but they were using different organs. Maimonides used his brain and his son used his heart. And you take the combination of both of them and you get what to, might be called the ideal religious personality. We're gonna stop here for today and thank you for joining me. And as I said before at the very beginning, if you have questions, comments, please email me, mdangel at jewishideas.org. I answer all email. I'm very fussy about that. So please feel free to share your thoughts. And if you have questions, or you want to be go further, let me know. And uh, we'll continue next week. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, chazak, chazak, be well, healthy, and happy. Shalom, shalom.